A long-lost ColecoVision cartridge imbued with an ancient evil incantation releases the forces of darkness on an unsuspecting populace, and humanity's only hope is a trio of video game nerds aided by genre legend Greg Grunberg and indie film icon Kevin Smith in Max Reload and the Nether Blasters, this week on the VFX for Indies podcast. With me today are Scott Condit and Jeremy Tramp, the masterminds between the indie sci-fi action comedy Max Reload and the Nether Blasters, which my team and I were privileged to create over 500 visual effect shots for. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Hey, thanks, Paul. Happy to be here, man. Yeah, man. Pleasure to be here. Right on. It's been a while. I haven't seen these guys in person in quite a while because they're busy. I'm busy. They are uh, kicking ass with their, their new company, uh, offensive marketing group, which we will hear about. Why don't you guys give us a quick overview of who you guys are uh, individually and as a partnership? Tell us a little bit about Cineforge and about your uh, your newest venture, OMG. Cool. Kick it off, sir. Yeah, I'm Scott Condit, uh, 41 year old, 41 year old filmmaker. I like long walks on the beach. You're old, dude. Um, I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm aging out, man. Um, no, so I'm Scott Condit. I'm one of the creative directors and owners here at Offensive Marketing Group. Uh, filmmaker, uh, creative writer, huge fan of Foxtrot X-Ray and Mr. Paul DeNigris. Uh, and yeah, one of the directors from Max Reload and the Nether Blasters, a fun little sci-fi action comedy we did a few years back, which is now in uh, worldwide distribution. Heck yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jeremy Tremp. A um, little bit of history. I graduated film school in 08 and then just kind of jumped right into um, the film set. Thankfully, when I graduated film school, uh, Michigan had just passed, I think it was like 45% film incentive. It was, it was the highest in the nation, which was absolutely crazy. So tons of independent and like lower Hollywood productions were filming there. And so that gave me the opportunity to get on a lot of pretty big sets as a assistant camera and then camera operator as well on a few of those. Um, so I was able to really dive in quickly. Um, and then from there, I kind of pivoted and wanted to start my own thing. And Ended up directing and shooting hundreds of music videos, um, and doing a lot of photography, and then we linked up in about 2015 or so, and yeah, man, started making some cool stuff, and ultimately led to Max Reload that we started shooting in what uh, 2018, I think it was. Yeah, winter of 2018. Yeah, yeah. 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 And now uh, I'm also a co-founder, uh, creative director at Offensive Marketing Group, which is the the bread and butter day to day at this point. Yeah, where we take our you know cinematic storytelling background um, and put that towards marketing the outdoor you know, uh, sectors. So and combining that love of cinema, right? Like yep. we've, we've had a chance to not only hit the hard edge of, of the marketing side of the firearms industry, but we've got a chance to work the cinematic side of our life into it too, working with uh, mm. teams like 8711 action design, the John Wick stunt team and things like that for higher end commercial spots. So bringing, um, bring that studio quality flair to the firearms industry has really been where OMG has been different from most of the conventional marketing in the space to date. Right on. And you're definitely tying in uh, your love of, uh, of geek cinema. I remember a spot that you worked on not too long ago that was very inspired by, by my favorite Blade Runner. I know you, you've done some recent stuff inspired by Predator. Um, you know, so, and it's, it's very cool to see you guys work the, uh, the geeky cinema lover angle into, uh, into the firearm space. And I'm sure those, I'm sure your clients eat that shit. Oh, yeah. They must yeah, love yeah. it. It's a lot of fun. It's cool to see the audience reaction, wanting more, asking for longer versions, the full movie length, the video game version, right? Like it's, uh, it's really cool to service that, you know, which that's, that's us, right? Yeah. We are those consumers as well. So we're just trying to make cool shit for people like us. Yeah. And that's kind of the unique thing too, about like our passion, it's sci-fi action. What do those things all inherently have infused you the blade runner, cool guns, man. So it's, uh, <laughs> It's, it's an inseparable part of Hollywood that, mm -hmm. that we found a way to, to bring to the forefront of what we do every day here. Awesome. Well, before we dive into Max Reload, um, give us some, some highlights because I know it was Max Reload was, was built on a series of steps, right? You guys were, were kind of working towards that with, uh, with some of the films that you worked on, some of the shorts and documentaries and things like that. So just give us the quick highlights of kind of, kind of the, uh, the formative years of, uh, of your partnership. 
leading towards Max. Yeah, man. Um, when we first got together and linked up, we just we we talked about doing. I think it was a, I think it was like a film competition or something like that for Comic Con. Yeah. yeah, and we were gonna do some like Metroid versus Halo or something something silly. Um, and we just kind of came to the conclusion that that's that was way outside of our of, of realistic, right? Because you've got to get these costumes and all these different props and whatnot. And yeah, um, I think we scrapped that idea and we decided just to make a short film. Yeah. And, and dude, Paul, you know, us super well, having been in the trenches with us for years and all the work we did on max, what started out like with us going back to the drawing board saying, okay, that's two, two grand. Let's go mm -hmm. back to zero independent filmmaking mindset. Let's work with what we've got. Let's be more realistic quickly evolved and spiraled again mm -hmm. out of control Always into, does. well, we've got a loose connection to Martin Cove from Karate Kid and now Cobra Kai is like his revived fame. And this, this uh, concept that we had for what was supposed to be a little short indie sci-fi film for Comic-Con went way too big. Then we went way small, scaled it back and then spiraled out of control. And we made a little film called Show No Mercy <laughs> that had um, a ton of VFX in it, mm -hmm. had People getting sucked into video game, old school arcade machines. A little and shootout scene. and Flying yeah. people in from Hollywood. And yeah. it, you know, it was still a very small little short. But uh, after that, and doing that the way that we know how, which is still super independent mm -hmm. and scrappy and no budget. Wearing many hats. Wearing many hats. We're like, dude, I think we can work together mm -hmm. beyond this because we survived this experience. So it evolved from there. Yeah. And then we jumped into Game Jam, the movie, which um, was more of an opportunity that we were given to produce for another company. Um, and we, we turned that into again, something way bigger than it initially initially was scoped out as, but, um, that was cool. Cause that was, that was kind of a, a bit of a passion as of ours as well, because yeah. we were following independent game developers as they did a 48 hour game jam. Yeah. And the winners of the game jam went on to out to LA to IndieK to network with, um, you know, big brands and, one of them ended up meeting with Oculus mm -hmm. and, and that kind of, it was, it was pretty cool. So it was cool to tell that story kind of as it evolved um, in a more documentary and filmmaking style rather yeah. than the narrative style. Um, and yeah. a benefit of that project, the Game Jam, the movie documentary, one of our producers, um, Ben Riker, was a professor at the institution where we filmed the majority of that Game Jam, which is where and how we met you, mm -hmm. Paul. Mm -hmm. So it all came full circle, man. Yeah. Like every project you end up, finding it leads to something bigger and better. At least that's always been our experience. Absolutely. I mean, a big, a big theme with uh, successful independent filmmakers is finding your tribe, mm -hmm. right? Finding the like-minded individuals who are going to go on the crazy journey with you to, to make something uh, that you individually might not have been able to achieve. Right. So yeah, that's, uh, that's very cool. And I remember, yeah, becoming aware of you guys with game jam and, uh, and being very interested in what you were doing and, and then seeing show no mercy and being like, all right, these guys, they got it going on. They, they're, they're leveraging all of this stuff to make yeah. some really cool shit. So, um, so yeah, we, at that point we were, my, my team and I, we were all in to, <laughs> to work with you guys. Um, so give us a, give us the, um, the back of the Blu-ray cover synopsis of Max Reload. <laughs> yeah. So Max Reload, um, the, the Blu-ray synopsis, right? A uh, small town video game store clerk accidentally unleashes the forces of evil from a cursed ColecoVision uh, game. I know it sounds nuts. I mean, I've been wanting to play this game since I could hold a controller. I knew he'd be back. I just had no idea there were any game cartridges left. I knew it was only a matter of time before the Harbinger found his one player, the one man capable of truly unlocking. My oh boy, the chosen one. Uh, chosen pawn, pawn, chosen pawn, and we're not even sure, maybe. Unless the store's on fire this weekend, I am not to be bothered when I'm jacked in. And this game was kind of an urban legend, much like Polybius or, mm -hmm. or some of these games that, that if you're really into gaming and nerd right. culture, they're the things that should not be or the things that almost like E.T. the game was kind of something we yeah. drift on is like so bad. They destroyed every copy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We took a lot of inspiration from like actual yeah. video game, real world lore. And, and we said, well, what if we do something kind of like Last Starfighter? meets Tron, meets uh, ridiculous like Knights of, of Badassdom, mm -hmm. kind of absurd comedy and, and culture and infused it all together. Um, and we did. And we did. Against all odds, we did. And with a lot of help from yourself and your team, um, many others, uh, we pulled this little indie film off for 
uh, a song and a pittance and uh, did it against numerous odds in how many days of shooting? Uh, ultimately 23, I think. 23 all overnight yeah. shots yeah. with the ridiculous and absurd 500 plus VFX shots written in for an indie film that had no budget. Yeah. And, and that's just the VFX that my team and I touched. There was a, there was a more beyond that, like the game imagery and stuff, which we'll, which we'll touch on. My, my next question was going to be what possessed you to make a movie yeah. this ambitious as your, as your first feature, but you, you sort of answered that already. It, it seemed like the inevitable uh, direction that you were going through all the projects that, that led you there. Yeah, we just we can't we can't do anything small. I mean, we start writing something and then you know it's it just we have this conversation all the time, dude. Yeah. Like, it, there's something wrong with us <laughs> in our approach. And and the funny thing is, man, like uh, blessing and curse, the capability and the naivete mm -hmm. mixed with stubbornness, and then the ability, like you said, to bring together a very skilled and much larger tribe than the two of us. To actually have the, the you know the technicians and the craftsmen and the artists, for some reason they jump on board and they see the vision and um, help us bring it across the finish line. Like looking back over what ended up becoming a two year, two and a half year mm -hmm. process of our life, yeah. dude. If you had shown us that roadmap when we started making the film, I'd been like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> you know, like my wife would have been like, yeah, you're out. Um, but no, she's she was super supportive the whole time. But it was like it's insanity when you look at the amount of of challenges, hurdles, um, not just technically, but you're, dude, you're checking your own sanity, like mm -hmm. nightly. I remember there's nights that I called Jeremy and I was like, dude, what have we gotten ourselves into? What if we show up sick tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Paul, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think answered the question, but yeah, a lot of... <laughs> no, lot that, of that, and, that did answer the question. I mean, you guys are obviously very ambitious and have, and have a vision, and I think that's what the the people like Martin Cove and uh, and Greg Grunberg and and all of the the actors that you brought about, uh, on board and then all of the the crew and the the behind the scenes talent the bullet line talent that you you brought on board we all saw the ambition we all saw the uh, the the reaching for <laughs> metaphorically reaching for the stars um, and and doing something that was really unexpected in the indie film space right I this think there's is... a lot of gusto as well of like you know like. I like that word. You know, it's like if if they can do it, we can do it. It was there was a lot of like, you know, oh, why dude. not? Why why shouldn't we be able to do this? Why yeah. can't people do this? Let's prove them, right? There was a lot yeah. of that just like, you know, let's let's do this and show people that it's a reality. Um I think we learned a lot that oh, yeah. uh, that we were humbled many times, but yeah. um through that process of refinement, you know, I think that was all a positive experience. And that's kind of like the indie spirit, dude. To sure. me like it was a union film, right? We had um yeah, yeah. It was it was all union actors. We had to go through SAG and all that stuff. Um, but it was still in a, I mean, it was on the very cusp of what would qualify for right. a you know ULB ultra low budget, ultra low budget right. indie. And we wanted to make a film that didn't feel like that. Right. We wanted it to feel like it had gone through a studio of some sort, right? Um, and if it wasn't for having that mindset, that indie mindset, mm -hmm. all those moments were like, well, no, you can't do it that way right. for, well, for a number of reasons, right. because you got 10 different people looking over your shoulder and, you know, no one's willing to do it that way. That was not the case on Max. Everyone's like, yeah, okay, we see what you wrote on the page. How can, how could that look? Yeah. And that was every step of the way. So what were some of the creative touchstones uh, for the film? I, you know, I always look at it as being kind of a throwback to the movies that we grew up on, right? The, in the eighties, really? you know, it's got very much a, uh, a kind of a ghostbusters vibe in a way yeah. where it's comedy, sci-fi horror action. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it, and it thrives on the characters and their interaction, not just on the effects, but Oh yeah. The effects are also really cool. Yeah. Uh, and I know you guys had a, an experience where you, you, uh, you, you brushed up against uh, Ernest Klein and uh, uh, ready player one. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's like always just reaching as far as possible, right? Like never taking no for an answer and just saying, what if, you know, that's how, how we reached out to Kevin Smith. And we did a very similar thing for Ernest Klein. We, we sat on a couch and we made a video appealing to his nerd side, essentially, and saying, hey, we're doing this thing. Um, it's very inspired by some of your work and we respect the hell out of you. And if you could help us promote this in any way and or give feedback in any way, um, you know, we would be honored 
uh, to, you know, just even be considered by your time. Yeah. Yeah. And we'd run into him at a book signing that uh, Arizona State University had hosted. And we were big fans of Ready Player One. Um, and we went down there and he gave a talk and it was before, I mean, he actually had announced at that reading that he was, gonna be that he was doing the film with Spielberg and that they were actually through Arizona visiting Spielberg's childhood home. And it hadn't hit mainstream news yet, but they did a little walk through, get your book signed at the end. Right. And everyone's getting kind of ushered through by the handler. They're like, you know, we got 200 people plus here. Got to keep moving the line along. But we snagged the opportunity for 30 seconds that, hey, man, we've got this mock-up poster we did for the film. Um, we did this little arcade short film mm -hmm. called Show No Mercy with the guy from Karate Kid, Martin Cove, I'm sure you know. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. So we're working on this new thing. Is there a chance you know we could reach out in the mm -hmm. future? And he's like, yeah. Yep. So we sent him that, and he loved it. And we reminded him that we met him at the book signing, which helped. And, yeah, man, it was uh, shooting your shot, so to speak, yeah. when you see the opportunity, take it. Yeah. And then, like you mentioned, you know, films from our childhood, we wanted this to feel like an E.T., a Goonies, a Last Starfighter, Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters. Yeah. You know, we shot it on uh, anamorphic lenses. Um, we we it, obviously we shot on red, but we didn't want it to feel like this super overly sharp, overly, you know, sanitized movie. We wanted it to feel like there was character. You know, there might be a, a, a shot that's not super stabilized, you know, that show that a human being made this film. Right. Um, and Indeed, so that, yeah. yeah, we really wanted it to feel like that. Like, yeah, you, so you could relate to it more, whether that worked or not. That was the intention. Yeah. I mean, the, the anamorphic lenses that you guys shot on definitely evoked, uh, again, those eighties, uh, action sci-fi movies, you know, you had those, those mm -hmm. beautiful lens flares that we, uh, we, we, my team and I had to replicate in some spots mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and it was just like, yeah, you see those images, and I, I yeah, I, it immediately takes me back to being, you know, fourteen and watching mm -hmm. Ghostbusters for the first time, and the those beautiful lens flares when they, yeah, when they fire man. up the proton packs. <laughs> I just saw on a podcast yesterday, or on a, a video yesterday, a vlog. Um, they had the Ecto cruising around New York. For oh Ghostbusters yeah, that 2. was a nice that video. Yeah, yeah. Casey yeah. nice that. Yep, we we, uh, we got stoked on that. We actually did a mock up poster. Um, with a concept artist, and we referenced the original Ghostbusters poster. I think it's one of the ones where they had their proton packs, it's from the back, mm -hmm. and they're looking up at the tower, you know, where the gatekeeper is, mm -hmm. and, and we're like, dude, do that, but with the Max Reload mm -hmm. characters, mm -hmm. that yeah. kind of style, that vibe, because if you think about how absurd the films were in the 80s, yeah. um, the premises were ridiculous, like right. Monster Squad, ridiculous, right. Ghostbusters, ridiculous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But it's that suspension of disbelief that I think that generation was willing. They were willing to go on those rides. And that's kind of what we hoped for viewers of Max. Just come on yeah. this ride, man, for, for mm. two hours and yeah. be absurd with us. How long were the various stages of the film's development, pre-production, production, post? You, you kind of touched on production yeah. uh, being very, very short. What would you say, 23 days? Mm -hmm. Physical, yeah. Yep. Physical production was 23 nights. Yep. All, yeah, all 23 over nights almost, yeah. So what was the pre-production uh, cycle like? How long did how long did you guys spend from when you started writing the script till cameras rolled, and then and then we'll, we'll segue into post. Yeah. So, uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong, because your memory on timelines is much better than mine. Typically, I think overall from writing through pre-pro, actual turning our office and mm -hmm. time into a production office for Max as a dedicated focus, it was about nine months. Yeah, probably. Um, it was pretty fast. Yeah. Um, yeah. No more than that, I think. You know, we, we've obviously been percolating the idea for quite a while. And but as far as like starting to sit down and put pen to paper and yeah. Yeah. I think we wrote the script over about three months. Right. Um, multiple drafts, of course. And then and then we started, uh, you know, raising money and, and doing that from within our camp and talking to creatives and it came together fast. I mean, respectively it it fast. Did. If you compare yeah. it to like a studio picture that could take right, God, ten yeah. years to get. And during like life. during the writing process, mm -hmm. we were scouting locations and we were talking to. So yeah, I think we were we were doing a lot at the same time. Right on. And then twenty three nights of mm -hmm. filming, uh, and then we jump into post. Yeah. How long was post? Post was hard, man, because it's like. You spend all this time making this thing or, you know, writing, producing, pre-production, then you kill yourself to make it. And then all of a sudden you've got to edit this thing because we edited it as well. Um, and you're still trying to make a living. So you're trying to do side jobs here and there. And it, man, the post, that, that was a slog. Um, just like the, the edit, the rough cuts, the tightening up of all that. Um, 
I feel like we were. I don't know. I don't remember how long Through we were. VFX? Just the edit mostly, oh, dude, right? Just the edit took. Because once we were mostly yeah. locked, it was VFX. And I, I think we were still tweaking here and there where we could, but. Yeah, the edit alone, dude, some limitations. It was too, at least six months, right? That much red footage that we were working with on that drive. Um, I think it took about six months, yeah, five to yeah. six months to get a cut that we were really happy with, of course, with temp score and yeah. trying to get you know it to a place where our composer could actually start scoring it, Jesse. Mm -hmm. um, and like you know, that was a, a great lesson too. Is on a feature, especially one with five hundred VFX shots, you coached us beautifully. We're, we're real renegade and like you know, oh, let's just try this shot and let's uh, let's try some effects on it. No, no, no. You're locking everything before you give it to your effects team mm -hmm. because they don't want to go back and do 20 different yeah. versions on different plates and everything else. So, yeah, yeah man, it was it was a process. Yeah. Overall, it took over a year, right? A year and a few months with effects to right. get a a cut, a deliverable cut done mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Right, and then as far as the the visual effects component, my team and I we were responsible for things like screen comps. Uh, the energy weapons, the nether creatures, uh, the glowing eyes, some miscellaneous cleanup and stuff. Um, yeah. Smoke, fire, red lightning, um, things like that. Yeah. But there was more beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the the uh, movie really was crafted in the in post in a right. way. It sure. really truly was the final rewrite. There was a um, lot of. Yeah, I mean the entire intro is is you know there's a few live shots, but the, most of the intro is is CG and and the gameplay footage, right? And then a big flashback is a complete like GI Joe animated sequence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then we had the pixel art as well. Right. We, overall, we had I think six, five or six different animation styles we worked in throughout the entire film, and those were all tributes to our childhood. Mm -hmm. You know, like side scroller video game, paper pixel boy, art, like yeah. Paperboy, and yeah, the NES games and yeah. Sega games we grew up playing. And then the G.I. Joe style, that that era of 2D. Um, yeah, well, you know, it's just very flat line drawn animation. Yep. Yep. Saturday morning cartoon animation was, was another. Mm -hmm. And then we had literal game developers who were working on video games use uh, 3D, you know, Unreal Engine and right. different softwares to make. Basically, they basically built a, like a World of Warcraft kind of clone yeah. like game that's, yeah. Using the cameras in the, yeah. the game making software as cameras. And Jeremy sat down with them as the DP. And was like, okay, let's try these angles mm -hmm. as we fly through this level you've created. And they're animating the characters that they made to our specs right. to look like they're talking. Yeah, Very which it was, it was a challenge, though, because you're communicating, like, film language and then to a video game, you know, like, language. And so it was it was, it was a lot of challenge just getting the vision. Because, you know, the, this isn't what they do. They don't make, like, cut scenes for a living. They make games that are played by people, not you push a button and it plays a sequence of clips. That's usually a whole separate. So it was, it was, it was a challenge just communicating and getting the right, um, just really getting the right stuff. But at the, at the end they, they nailed it and it they was really cool to, yeah. to see it all come together. It was just, it's just another challenge. You don't ex anticipate you're like, Oh, just a, you know, this game scene, it's going to be an easy little, you know, dude, you know, there, there is. Easy. Yeah. Anything you write on that page, yeah. someone has to bring to life. You know, that intimately Paul right. <laughs> and the littlest thing can be, you know, hours and hours in post replacing something in that shot, in that composition. Yeah. And that whole sequence where we're first introduced to Max and, and uh, Lizzie and Reggie, and we're introduced to Eugene, though we don't realize it right up front, that whole sequence it's, it's happening on all these different levels, right? Cause we're in the game world. We're over their shoulders, looking at their screens. We're, we're seeing their first person web camera as they're talking to each other. We're cutting to their characters as if they're having a conversation and it's all very intricate and crafted. And, and, and I know you, you guys probably had, you know, X number of frames that we possibly could use and one frame longer and the game engine falls apart or yeah, doesn't exactly. work, right. <laughs> you know? And so you're having to cut it all to the bone and make it all work. And, and uh, I know there was a lot of experimentation and se sequences like that, where it was like, how much do we see the game engine? How much do we spend on, on Max's face? Yeah, you know, how, how do we, how do we keep it moving mm -hmm. um, from, uh, from, you know, shot to shot? Um, and keep the story moving forward and also not, you know, show our ass <laughs> when the game, yeah. when the game imagery doesn't work or, right. or the, uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Cause um, the way the, the, they had to do it, they didn't make like individual shots. So I would get this file that was like all the sequences in one file. 
and the characters would go from like their T pose to like snap into this thing and the camera would like snap here and then it would begin its sequence and then they would snap back into like a T pose and the camera would snap. So it was like trying to like make sense of what on earth yeah, you're doing was going on. Real surgery, man. Was, uh, it was an interesting, it was, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, the animation side of things, who, who was responsible for the, uh, those, the cool 2D animated sequence, uh, mm -hmm. Eugene's big um, origin story, if you will. Was, uh... you know. Yeah. So we had, uh, so Dan Fusselman, um worked with us he was one of our one of our good buddies you know dan who's a friend of yours as well amazing artist and he helmed one of the animation teams and mm -hmm. they did most of the 2d style mm -hmm. uh animations and there was about four individuals under dan on that team who were just incredible artists and they all handled certain aspects of that pipeline and then we the, had the cut the the transition so you're talking about the pixel alexis stuff. yeah yeah, okay. yeah, yeah 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 alexis uh, i believe he's out of Somewhere out of the UK. Where did we connect with him? So, you like found him yeah, somewhere? I saw on, it wasn't Kickstarter, it was some project yeah. that he posted. Oh, that's right. And he had teamed up with the one of the game designers who did like the original Shinobi yep. games. Yep. And they were doing some kind of a new project together that was pixel art based. And Incredible I was like, pixel art. I've never seen pixel art like yeah, that before. Yeah. Um, and that's the beauty of the internet, man. And also independently spirited minded artists is you can reach out to anybody nowadays mm -hmm and find their Instagram handle or even big directors, man. And just say, Hey dude, I love what you're doing. Here's kind of what we have going on. Can we chat? And you'd be very surprised. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, a lot of them will get back to you and say, yeah, man, that sounds cool. Let's, let's yep. talk. Yeah. And the pixel art thing came about that. That was a late edition, right? The, the, the animated sequence, yeah. and all the game, the gameplay sequences, those were all baked into the script. You knew right. that those were going to be necessary right up front. Yeah. But the pixel art stuff came about from conversations that you had in post. It and was a fix. Yeah, there was. Yeah, exactly. Because there were. We screwed up. <laughs> well, there was a lot of like high. Like there was a lot of things that we just couldn't do very easily. A drone shot of a city as a as the FFS fan um, yeah, was driving, was driving you know, um, transitions where he's riding his bike at night. Right. We don't have these a crane with. 18 K's to light the street. Right. Like, yeah. so how can we keep a cool theme and save money? And those add, transitions you know, were mostly like max on his bike to a lot of them. They were, they were and, take from scene to scene. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. And we were thinking, okay, you know, max wears a hoodie. We'll just get a double and throw a hoodie right. on him and we'll, we'll, we'll pick up all this stuff later. We'll right. film it all later. Right. Well, this, you know, seasons change, yeah. time goes on. Um, and this is one of those cool instances where, it forced our hand in a creative way to go, what's an alternative option for this? Yeah. What's a cool way to show Max? Filmmaking is problem solving. This dude lives in a video game in his headspace. The movie's literally about them getting sucked into a game at a mm -hmm. point. So let's show him through the lens of transition cutscenes. Yeah. Stuff we grew up, you know, when you're playing a video game and right. they're trying to weave a story together. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. that's exactly what those scenes are in our film. So yeah. let's do it that way. Yeah, it, and it, it dovetails really well with the end where they, they get sucked into a game, but then it's, you didn't CG animate that, right? right you right. just filmed it. Action, you just art directed yeah. it and dressed them in costumes and filmed it. And yeah. so the, the line between reality and game world and Max's imagination and what he's really experiencing is constantly being blurred, right? Like literally from the from the first frame that we see him mm -hmm. after the ancient Egypt um, prologue, which of course, these movies always start in, ancient Mesopotamia right. or, you yeah. know, we're starting something like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I always, <laughs> I always wanted the opening title, you know, when, when we see that shot of the pyramid to be like ancient Egypt, duh. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen this before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and that was a fun sequence transitioning into that amazing pyramid interior set that was an absolute blast to film on. And then that holographic game table, that game table gave us quite a challenge. In, it was uh, challenging. Yeah. 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 Determining right. the look for that, man, it took a couple iterations yep. and then you nailed it. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was so, again, so loosely written on the page, mm -hmm. you know, like one slug line on a script can be like an astral projection on mm -hmm. top of a marble table. Okay, cool. But what does that really look like? Well, that can take a few iterations. Right. Right. Yeah. So we had, uh, we had quite a bit of uh, look dev that we had to do on that. Um, because you guys had ideas about what you wanted it to look like. I had ideas and we were trying to kind of meet in the middle and figure out what is, 
what does quote unquote galactic chess look like? What what is what does it look like that this you know nether creature, the the, the game master uh, yeah. creature, you know what is what is it that he would play? It's not chess because that's too much of a cliche. You know the the uh, the seventh seal, Max von Sydow, mm-hmm. you know that that kind of thing. But it's still the same sort of concept. They're playing for they're playing for fate, the fate of the village, the fate exactly. of the gamer. But it has to be something that you know we we can understand without with no exposition about how the rules work. It has yeah. to be completely visual. It has to obviously be a game that has rules that are internally consistent. But oh yeah, you know the actor is just sort of randomly moving this piece yeah. around this <laughs> blank piece of plexiglass, and then we have to we have to fill it out. After. Yeah. It's a scene too. It was MOS. Like there, there's no dialogue. No one's telling you, yes, we're gonna we're gonna duel now and play this game right. for the fate of the universe. No, it was just mm-hmm. silent with looks between the actors, which they did brilliantly. And and then you coming up with that visual, you know, the graphic representation where you can clearly tell, okay, cool. There are pieces that are overtaking, and there's connective tissue between these moves, and clearly they are playing some form of, like yeah. you said, galactic chess. It, right. it worked out, man. It was it was a struggle, but it turned out great. So that was one that took a lot of look dev. The the titular Nether Blasters. I, I have one of them over here uh, on my shelf uh, that you guys you guys gave me um, from the set right there. Yeah, from man, the that set. Was, that's one of that's one of Eugene's actual screen used blasters. It's that's uh, right. There's no replica Paul. That's 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 <laughs> the OG blaster. <laughs> Indeed, uh, screen used and all of that. Um, but uh, took us a took us a while to figure that out to figure out what that looked like and how the how the blasters moved and all the different yeah. little elements of sparks and corkscrew you know electrons and all of that sort of stuff um you want to talk about a little bit about you know sort of the inspiration there and what what we were after yeah it's kind of like a ghostbusters-esque you know i think that was probably yeah. the closest um comp that we were thinking about that that would look like because it's, it's dude, ultraviolet yeah. uh that's my favorite white light or whatever <laughs> yeah. he yeah. says the, the, spectral the inside joke was in the, that was in the dialogue right there was like again going back to absurdity and you know in ghostbusters they build up those characters to be ultra brilliant you know particle mm-hmm. physicists and right. paranormal experts and okay it's kind of plausible these dudes they've got a nuclear reactor in the basement of a fire station uh-huh. Well, the funny turn it on its head thing is we've got this ultra brilliant game designer who we never fully explained like how we became, uh, you know, a, an energy weapon expert. Yeah. And even he kind of doesn't really know clearly through his description of shit that doesn't right. make any sense. But we just say, again, go with us on this ride. and He's going to give these kids a bunch of these weapons that are somehow <laughs> able to disrupt the evil nether. Um, and dude, down to the color schemes, too, that we mm-hmm. had talked about with you. That was another throwback to kind of cartoons of the 80s, like G.I. Joe, Transformers, the bad guys. And, you know, even looking at Star Wars, red, you know, they're always shooting mm-hmm. red laser beams. The good guys are shooting blue or green. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of worked a little bit of that into the approach to uh, tipping our hat to the genres we we loved growing up when it came to the Nether Blasters. Yeah, because we had a, we had then established um Early on, that nether the nether was going to be red, and you guys did a lot of red accent lighting and uh, and stuff on set whenever whenever yep. nether energy was involved. Uh, so yeah, we had set that tone right up right up front. You know, during production, um, you guys use those those quasar lights to do oh. you know red accents on things whenever mm-hmm. like nether creatures were visible, like the nether kraken, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and when when Reggie, when we first see the nether blaster guns in action. Reggie getting getting zapped and did all those beautiful green accents with the lighting. And that was a, a, a really excellent case of we thought that out ahead of time. Yes. You know, uh, Dan and I shared, uh, Dan Fossilman and I shared visual effects supervisor duties. So when I wasn't on set, he was. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we talked through that, that anytime we were doing any sort of energy weapons, uh, you know, energy creatures, whatever, that, the, that you guys were going to help us a lot just by simply flicking on a light, mm-hmm. you know, and that really sells the reality of, yeah, there's, there's this green mm-hmm. energy thing flying across the room and it's creating shadows and highlights on, you know, all the Chrome and stuff in the, all that motivated area. lighting. Right. Dude. Yeah. 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 Our gaffer, Jason Seavers with a, a green two foot quasar on a stick and he would, he was running by as if that's where the, you know, the, the light was going. Simulating the contrail yeah. or the, the trail of energy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Dude, yeah. 
history. Amazing our science came through huge on yeah, this picture for us, man. Tons of tons of gear for us to use, which was yeah. phenomenal for you know for an indie to hit them up and say, "Hey, this is what we're doing." That's amazing, and especially in in like the film industry, that does not happen. People do not give you a free sandwich ever. <laughs> Because they know you're going to buy it. You're going to yeah. rent it. You need it. There's no other option. So for them to support us like that. Well, I think it's because they knew we were indie and we were, we were starving. We needed the sandwich, you know? <laughs> so they're like, all right, you're not a big studio. We'll throw you a bone here. Yeah, Here's just, some lights. It, it seems like those, 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 the people that run that organization are very similar to us. And I think they're, they care and their, their heart is, is where ours is. And, and so it was, it was cool for them to throw us a bone like that. That helped right. a ton. Obviously the, uh, the nether creatures were another another big challenge, right? Yeah. And we had to keep them consistent with the the game art, yep. right? So we established early on what the nether specters and the nether kraken look like in the game world. And then you wanted them to be in our real world. And you guys made the smart choice that most of the time the nether specters would just manifest as glowing red eyes, right? Mm -hmm. So we weren't doing full CG photorealistic characters. Yeah. Um, because that's a, that's a budget breaker. That's a that's a uh, something that an indie film is just not going to no. be able to pull off, and certainly not the amount of um, nether possessed people that you wanted on screen. I mean, you had three main characters who are nether possessed. Four, four, uh, really, if you count the man in black, the the suited right. man, as he was called in the uh, in the script. Yeah, um, yeah, and to have them as you know being motion captured or or just you know hand animated cg creatures um it just wasn't going to happen uh at, at that budget level so so the smart the smart choice was well when the when the nether is in somebody it, they manifest as glowing red eyes we did kind a of ton of glowing red eyes you know? yeah. yeah um and, and that was probably the bulk of our comps i would say maybe more than probably more than a third of our comps were glowing red eyes and we spent a lot of time on yeah. look dev on that you know we, it's tough because the, the eyes are the window to the soul you know and right. when you're messing with the eyes it, it it's very easy for it to look weird uncanny off and uh yeah once we dialed it in i think you absolutely nailed it so it was, it was cool to see that come to life yeah yeah and we and we spent a bunch of iterations on it like um trying to figure out you know what did seth and his crew look like as the mini bosses who had to have a little bit more character. We had to we had yeah. to get get a little more malice and a little more intent of, out of their eyes. Whereas, like when Reggie is possessed, uh, or when the just you know mm -hmm. randos walking on the street, I'm one of the randos. Uh, yeah, you had a little video um, on there, man. That's right with yeah. your team. <laughs> um, you know, or the like the students at the school when they when right. they they wage their final assault on the servers at the end of the movie. Um, you know, they had to be more like the possessed drones with no with no window into the soul, right? So, the, so there were definitely a couple of different key looks, and the suited man definitely had to have his own his own mojo going on with his eyes. Yeah. So it wasn't it wasn't just a one size fits all solution. It really, you know, we had to kind of build a a system for it, and um, and I, I built a essentially an eye rig for my team, so you could kind of like dial. I want more pupil. I want less pupil. I want more glow, less glow. It needs to be redder. It needs to be pinker. You know, we could yeah. we could kind of finesse that from shot to shot um, and yeah and that's that was a lot of the the early stages you know like the first maybe four weeks of of post of vfx was let's let's do all this look dev blasters eyes the galactic chess figure all that out um mm -hmm. and then that's not even counting you know all of the different screen art you know every time they're looking at a computer every time they're playing a game every time they're talking to each other on a webcam those are generally green screen, mm -hmm. green displays on uh, on monitors. So there was a ton of that work. Yes, um, there was. Yeah. Yes, there was. Yeah. Of course, somebody decided to have a green chair <laughs> on set for a lot of those. That's bad, bad call. <laughs> I know. I don't know. I don't know where our VFX supervisor was on that call. That's wild because mm. green, the green, green chair, must, green screen. He must not have been there that day. <laughs> <laughs> you raised like a really cool point too, though. The cool thing for us was like collaborating with you and your team um, and you being the point man that specifically we could, we could share a vision with and say, Hey man, here's kind of what we're going for. Or, Hey, we don't exactly know what we want this to look like, but here's some inspiration. What do you think? And you'd throw back awesome ideas. Um, and I remember you jogged my memory there. The whole thing with the eyes, it was a very interesting 
conversation because at one point I think we'd envisioned after Seth and the mini boss, his trio of, of bad guys, essentially the mini boss kids who were kind of the antagonist against Max and his crew. We're like, yeah, after they get possessed, you know, they have red eyes the whole movie. Yeah. Like they're, they're like mm. demonically possessed. Right. But then we had this conversation with you and based on the looks and the process, you don't want to steal the, yeah. the window of the soul. Like you said, from an actor too, because so much performance like Lucas Gage and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, those, those guys just gave such good looks you cover up that mm-hmm. with the glowing red eyes the entire time. You're stealing something from that performance, I think we realized. So we're like, all right, this possession is inside them. The manifestation of it visually is a little more transient. Um, and, you know, it also, independently minded, again, it, at a point we had this discussion. And it was like, yeah, it's also going to save time mm-hmm. and money. Mm-hmm. So let's give them that better performance moment. Let's let them have yeah. those eyes. And when those eyes come out, it, it's, flares it means up. something. You yeah. know, it's, it's the, it's the intensity of that scene happens far more. So yeah, absolutely. And that whole process was a treat, man, especially working with you and having you communicate options and being super receptive to everything we brought to the table. Yeah. It brought better out of uh, some of those possibilities. Yeah. So I think it was a happy accident. There's one part where Seth is right up in Eugene's face you know, Eugene is sort of cowed on the ground and the, the you know, uh, he's Seth, leaning is, over Seth is leaning over him. And I don't remember if it happened by accident or it was something that we, that my team internally decided to try, but there's one part where he gets really intense and we decided let's make the eyes even brighter and they flare forced. up more and may, and, and we were, we were, uh, manually painting in light on Eugene's face mm. so that it was as if the light was coming yeah. out of, yeah. sets eyes uh, like beams yeah. and hitting um hitting eugene on the face and we were like let's let's try and let's hit this when 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 lucas hits this word let's make those eyes just like flare out and um and i think it was like a let's try it and see and we yeah. we liked it and we pitched it to you and you were like oh my god this is the coolest <laughs> and so we, we then selectively found spots um for uh for seth and for the suited man where we would do that sort of ramp up to to yeah. accentuate almost as if the actor had control over sure over Absolutely. that as part of their body language yeah yeah, yeah. That, Great, that's yeah. the best example of effects well done for me man is that kind of i mean of course there's the razzle dazzle we're all fans of marvel films and all the wild sci-fi stuff we love but performance enhancing moments like that where it's like oh that's hmm. just a nice little little touch a little enhancement a little flair yeah 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 it's, i mean it's all about performance and story right when you when you're making an indie, well, I mean theoretically, when you're making any film, but when you're making an indie, where every dollar has to count, yep. you, every pixel that you're pushing needs to be for a reason. Mm-hmm. Every pixel that's being manipulated on screen needs to be for a reason, and it was always to help you guys tell the story, and it was always to improve the performance, to motivate the drama, to you know, so that when when Max and crew are reacting something to something that what they're reacting to is legit and it feels tactile and feels like it's, it's in the space Um, to go back to our nether creatures. You know, the other choice that we made early on again, to try and avoid doing uh, fully photoreal CG creatures was that in our plane, the, the creatures manifest as energy. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we ended up being able to leverage the game engine assets. So the, your, mm-hmm. your game art designers turned over their rigs to us. And then we were u- able to use that to drive a particle sim. Uh, so they became made out of, you know, mm-hmm. ions or whatever at, that danced around in the shape of the creature. Um, and we didn't have to, you know, try and create skin and subsurface scattering and, you know, proper deformations and, you know, try and do Gollum on a, Right. ultra low budget film and do yeah. that for, you know, multiple creatures throughout the movie. In particular, the one that I was pointed as my biggest point of pride is that reveal of the nether crag. And when, when mm-hmm. Seth comes walking in with mm-hmm. it, you know, on a leash. Yeah, it's in super slow-mo. Yeah. And yeah. lightning's going off in the background, yeah. highlighting them from yeah. behind. And yeah, dude, if we geeked out too. When you showed us that particle sim, um, you know, look, because a huge predator fan, you mm-hmm. know, and it was like, okay, cool. So these things are kind of, they're breaching their way from the game world mm-hmm. into real world. Well, what is that? What are games? It's yeah. all data and digital and energy. And, and so that, re, you know, that representation of it visually just worked. Um, but yeah, that shot in particular of the nether Kragen, mm-hmm. dude, 
That was the show style. That was the trailer moment. When yeah. we saw you putting that together, we're like, that's going in the trailer for sure. <laughs> that was a fun night on on set. Um, that was that was one of the nights that I was able to 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 hang with you guys through the, through the entire uh, uh, shoot day. Uh, and of course, I was you know geeking out talking to Greg Grunberg, right? Here oh, and, and Lynn, here's Lynn Shay. Come yeah. on. Oh, and Lynn Shay. Yeah, we. I had a blast talking talking to them um, and, and and getting to know them, and uh, so that was that was awesome. Like that's one of those pinch me moments. Like here's a dude who's in Star Trek and Star Wars and all yeah. this other stuff, and he's just like. You know, just bullshitting yeah, like, with me on the couch in between yeah. takes. <laughs> He's a good dude, man. Yeah. Also a producer awesome. on this film, a star and a producer. Yeah. 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 It was awesome. And it was great to meet meet his son. His son played the younger version of his character. And, and uh, yeah. And that was a, that was a blast just to, to see that and see how much he supported the, the film. But being on set uh, that night, one of the things we were, we had discussed ahead of time was even though the Kraken is made out of energy, it needs to feel dangerous. It needs to feel like it can actually influence mm-hmm. our world. We need it to attack Steve. We need it to feel like Max and company are in danger when it's when it you know, it comes into the garage. We need, you know, Eugene to to Eugene is scared witless out <laughs> of it at yeah. a certain point. We need to motivate that, right? It has to it has to feel dangerous and real and and we needed a, a reference, you know. Like Jeremy needed to know where to point the camera. Where's the thing's head? Mm-hmm. So we made this really ridiculous puppet. It's just a green ball on a stick with two little LED lights for where the eyes are supposed to be. Yep. And, you know, and the, the S&M gimp collar on Dude, bound by a chain. I can't uh, tell how many people wore that damn thing on set. <laughs> I haven't seen photos from that night. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And, and in that big reveal shot, uh, Scott, I think you were the puppeteer for yeah, that's right. for that's right. part of that for for the big reveal so you come walking in in the behind the scenes footage you know ca- carrying mm-hmm. this thing and trying to trying to evoke your 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 badass self uh to to give us some reference for how the kraken should move and then i i uh, had to of course jump in right we, we, what's the point of being visual effects right. supervisor if you can't be ridiculous Dude, you, on set you killed it yeah <laughs> it was awesome that- but then the other thing we did was we wanted the the kraken to charge down the hallway mm-hmm. and knock pictures and stuff off the wall. So, you know, production designer, uh, Jennifer Nesbitt, she put up all these pictures on the, on the wall. And then, um, you guys just rolled up, just rolled a long time. And I went one by one and knocked things off the wall. And, um, and then we, we combined all of that so that as it, as it barrels down the hallway, mm-hmm. pictures are flying off and, you know, there's a little spark, little arcs of energy coming off and all of that stuff again, to try and make it feel, uh, feel real. It totally, yeah, it sold it, man. Mm-hmm. And that was Jen's house too, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, it was. God bless her. She let us uh, destroy her house for that <laughs> couple of days too. Yeah, right. And then the last, um, the last bit uh, that I love, and it's just a, it's such a simple thing when the um, when the Kragen gets vaporized, right by the uh, what did you guys call it again? The, the, he hits the button, the, the the vortex. It was like uh, something vortex. It was button. a really long name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was some kind of yeah. disruptor, some kind of EMP pulse type, in theory. Yeah, yeah, the That's EMP the vortex, right? So Max slaps that button and it zaps the mini bosses away and it vaporizes the Kragen. So now the, the digital Kragen is wearing a digital collar that is a replica of the real GIMP collar that we had on set. And then um, I think I I think I, I begged you. I was like, please, just uh-huh. give me a shot of the, the collar hitting the floor, yeah. you know? And you're like, all right, if there's time. And I was like, come on, just put it, just put it on the floor and just drop the collar in the shot. And you did it and it's in the cut because it like, you oh, see the thing cold. vaporize and you see the digital collar kind of fall through it as it disappears. And then you cut to yeah. the practical collar falling and there's little red wisps coming off of it. And the collars, they don't really match. It's one of those, like, if you it's really want to investigate the con, yeah, they go, it goes from this big to this big. His so neck is stretching it out. But it's, I mean, it's, but it makes it feel like that thing was really there. It really had a chain around its neck. It really had this collar on and it, and it all ties together. Mm-hmm. It's just these stupid low budget little, right. little tricks. Just like 60 yeah. seconds, Jeremy, just give me this shot, please. It's going to make all of our lives easier. Mm-hmm. Just trust me. Yeah. And it, and it did, man. It, it sold it. What's something that you took away from Max Reload from the VFX process in particular that has kind of changed the way you do things or maybe has has influenced or informed how you approach future projects or how you might tackle a, a future film <laughs> sequel? Uh, 
<laughs> pre-production. Yeah, man. That's planning shots, you know, planning everything. That's yeah. that's become uh, a huge part of it. You know, that's something that we've learned, um, especially when, when, you know, you're, when you're running a business, time is money. And if you don't put in the time, you will spend more money. So um, making sure that we're planning more, uh, making sure that things are dialed in more, having conversations about how things will look, how they should be shot, how to support the, sh you know, the CG in, in camera, um, practical versus CG. Yeah. Uh, all that stuff is, is heavily influenced how we've adjusted and changed yeah. and grown. Agreed, man. Yeah. Conversations are cheap, right? Um, but they can be very valuable. Uh, you know, it's like having those pre-production conversations with yourself and talking with our team through exactly what we want things to look like and pull, taking the time to pull references. I think it's, it's an easy trap to fall into, particularly if you have a skilled team to say mm -hmm. that phrase that everyone jokes about and everyone hates, Oh, well, we can fix it in post and the greatest wizards in the world. They can, um, at great expense and at great cost in terms of time. So, you know, don't, don't rest on the, the skill of your team in that way, but leverage that time and pre-pro if you've got it to communicate with your team and make sure you're truly on the same page and do pre vis man, storyboards, even if it's a napkin sketch all the way up through putting together cool lookbooks and textures. We do all of that now, mm -hmm. which I'm sure it makes you happy to hear when we rope you into the next, you know, feature, Paul, those things will be in place where we had some of those things on Max, right. but certainly a lot of them were like, I will figure it out. We'll, right. we'll figure it out after we shoot it. We know what we need to shoot so you can have it as a canvas, yeah. but we'll and, figure you know, it out. And, you know, devil's advocate, we wouldn't have made this movie if we didn't have that spirit. Mm -hmm. We would not have – because it takes a lot of work. It's very daunting, and you start to quickly realize that you cannot actually do what you were set out to do. But when you just throw mm -hmm. yourself in, you will figure a way out. Dude, if you – So yeah, the, the, the devil advocate is the, the naivety yeah. of, of going into this, um, that the world's our oyster is the only reason – we made this film. Indie film spirit, man. If you, know? if you let the lawyers and accountants approve everything before right. they let you do anything, you'll never make anything. Yeah. Um, but if you go into it like a knucklehead like mm -hmm. we did with a, a willing team of badasses, mm -hmm. something cool can come out of it. And that was that was the case yeah. with Max. So planning. Planning and pre-production, but not so much that you paralyze yourself with planning. Right. Well said. Yeah. I think that I think that's I, I think that's the thing. A lot of um, the other thing you said was when it's a business, you're burning money, right? A lot of independent filmmakers don't necessarily, when they're first getting started, they don't necessarily treat it like a business. They treat it as art first and business second. And it's really, mm -hmm. they're hand in hand. One doesn't happen without the other. Right. Um, you know, everything moves on time and money. Time and money is always the enemy. Um, and you have to you have to respect that. And the only way to, to do that is to approach it as a business. We yeah. may not all be making money on it, Right, it's an independent film. It's ultra low budget. Sure. Nobody's getting rich in, at that budget level, but at the same time, money's a finite resource. Right? Absolutely. You yeah, can... people aren't going to show up when that money runs dry for yeah. even with the most ambitious uh, artistic crew. You know, and when you're working with OPM, man, other people's money, mm -hmm. you better damn well have good justification for how you're spending it and that time. Right on. So. Uh, a young independent filmmaker comes to you and says, I have this idea. I watched Max Reload and I was inspired and I want to make a, a movie that relies heavily on VFX, but I have no idea where to start. What do you tell them? We just give them your card. <laughs> and then we tell them <laughs> to not. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, no, I mean, it, it, that's a, it's a healthy conversation to it's, be had. Yeah, I mean, the thing is we had, I mean both of us a decade of experience before we even you know it's like you get out of film school and you're like i'm the director i want to be the director i want to make movies i want to Everyone make another to star trek movie and it's like yeah dude no like how about make a, a narrative film that has zero vfx and learn how to tell a story oh right? dude if i could go back and have this conversation with us five years ago i'd be like look let's do our reservoir dogs first right. before we go do you know ghostbusters right. on our dime well yeah it's you know it's it's um I always looked at it when I went to film school as, okay, what can I, what do I absolutely know that I can do well, good or well, right? There's a lot of ideas that I have that I'm way more passionate about, but yeah. I could not pull them off, right? It's going to be bad. So if I just continue to stick with the things that I can do well, I will learn enough. And over time, I'll get to the thing that I actually wanted to do in the first place. Midget right? porn. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, I don't know why you have this guy <laughs> in your podcast. We're hitting that mark. Uh, but no, um, you, just, you know, you just got me demonetized. Thanks. 
it's uh it's <laughs> it's baby steps man i mean everyone wants to make their best idea first um and that's oftentimes not going to pan out you know it's just, that's just the reality because of of skill and time money many many factors yeah start small um and just perfect your craft until you are at the point to where you can really do that thing you're extremely passionate dude about. it sounds trite we talk about this all the time we talk about it with our team who a lot of them are very they're, they're all very talented but they're all younger um for the most part on the content creation side it's like you got one of these in your pocket you got a studio that yeah. we didn't grow up none of us did having um and it's not about the gear it's not about having star power show me what you can do with mm -hmm. that and if you can't show me something with that who's going to give you money to make that big thing that's inside of your head why should they that's a good question for every up and coming content creator, right? Um, particularly aspiring filmmakers. It's great advice. Great advice. So, where can people find Max Reload to watch? Where is I know it's out in distribution in lots of places, but where can where can they easily find it? Yeah, man, um, it's on Amazon. Uh, if you go through any of the Amazon channels, or if you have a subscription to Prime, it's on there. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get it through. Tubi, uh, right? Tubi, Peacock, Redbox yeah. still has it on the Redbox Digital. Yeah. It was in their machines for a while, which was a trip. I mean, who's using physical media anymore? But right. some people were. Um, and it's on a number of other streaming platforms. The only one that we didn't sign a deal with was Netflix. And uh, pretty much everywhere else, it's it's uh, available, man. Mm -hmm. And is it available outside the U.S.? Yeah, it's yep. distributed, distributed uh, physically in Japan. Spain. And Germany, Germany is coming up and then uh Europe somewhere Europe Taiwan yeah, yeah and so the, U the UK we, we have like a Japanese version and a, and a UK version is pretty cool dude those posters are rad yeah yeah <laughs> where can uh, people find out more about what you guys are up to yeah www.offensivegroup.com that's yeah. that's our website uh, that's the handle for most of our um Instagram stuff and at offensive group yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah, we've got some we've got some cool stuff coming up. We're trying to bring more of the narrative yeah. um, storytelling to marketing in a in a really unique way. Um, so that's yeah, we've got some stuff in the works. We've done some really cool things, some some more narrative things, some more action oriented things, mm -hmm. and we're just trying to ramp that side up. Heavy more. on the sci fi tactical yeah. action, um, shorter shorter format content lets us experiment more. So we're doing a lot of that. Yeah, and then there's Jeremy's OnlyFans. Yep, um, it's only feet though. Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually I'm, I'm working on only grands you know there's a lot of grandmas out there that, wow, only grams yeah, they good. make cookies come on dude yeah. like it's it's how to it's like a cooking thing <laughs> i'm sorry paul <laughs> this all is what righty you, dude I, we haven't seen you in long enough <laughs> all right well with that i don't know i there's no way to follow that up so i'm going to uh thank scott and jeremy for being part of uh this episode uh love you guys love, love working you, on max reload can't wait to do it again let's uh let's do that max reloaded sequel one of these days let's party <laughs> let's party brother <laughs> absolutely thanks so much for joining us on today's episode of the vfx for indies podcast you can find transcripts, images, and other cool stuff at our website, vfxforindies.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, comment on either YouTube or your favorite podcast app. On behalf of everyone at Foxtrot X-Ray, I'm Chief Pixel Pusher, Paul Denegris, and we all thank you so much for your support of the show. See you next time.